Okay, well, we can get started. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the eighth lecture in this series on medieval Armenian poetry. Um, if you remember last time, we looked at the riddles of Nersesh Norali and saw how these church ecclesiastic figures were starting to write in a literary form of the language that was not anymore following precisely the standard set by the classical Armenian of the fifth century, but rather was modeled on the vernacular of the time, closer to the way that people spoke at the time. And we're now entering a period in the 12th century and or, yeah, 13th century, 14th century, where that uh, becomes even the norm for uh, a larger number of poets, many of whom still have connections with the church and are educated at monasteries. Some of them are monks. Um, but this way of writing in Middle Armenian, a form of the language closer to the spoken vernacular, becomes more and more popular. Um, the figure we're going to look at tonight is Gostantin Yerzengatsi. And he is a religious poet who wrote both for monks and laity. And we'll see uh, why that's relevant in the course of the lecture. But first of all, as his name indicates, Yerzengatsi, he was from Yerzenga. Now, Yerzenga, you can see here uh, in, the, in the green, in the middle of the map. Um, this was on an important trade route that connected um, uh, the West, also Gilikia, and went all throughout Armenia uh, towards the East into uh, Iranian territory. And um, Hovana Yerzengatsi lived in the 13th and 14th century. And around that time, Yerzenga became a center of learning. Um, this is a period in which there's uh, not really one major empire reigning over everything, but there's a lot of scattered smaller rulers. And what that means is you have a lot of different people uh, living around each other, speaking different languages of different religions, sharing literary traditions. Around this time, you get the first uh, poetry, literary poetry written in early forms of Turkish. You also get poetry beginning in New Persian. Um, Michael Pfeiffer's book, which I've mentioned before, kind of uh, looks at the way that Konstantin Yerzengatsi and Nersa Shnodali were uh, writing poetry around the same time that uh, these other Turkish and Persian poets were writing and how all of them drew on kind of a shared vocabulary and symbols of meaning uh, based on a kind of like shared cultural and religious view of the world. And uh, Yerzenga, because it was on this trade route, was a center of the exchange of intellectual and poetic currents as different people were coming back and forth. Um, also, thanks to the merchant activity and other business activity that comes about as a result of being on a major trade route, there was a lot of funding and support for monasteries and other schools and intellectual centers, uh, thanks to which there are several uh, well-known writers from Yerzenga at around this time. One of them is Hovanas of Yerzenga who lived in the 13th century, was a monk and theologian. He's the author of many uh, works. He wrote Sharagans, um, including uh, Sharagan on Nerses the Great, Catholicus Nerses the Great, whose grave uh, was rediscovered in this period. And so Hovana Savirzenga wrote a Sharagan to, um, in praise of him as they were kind of uh, re-establishing a new way of commemorating St. Nersas. He also, you can see the, the kind of breadth of his learning and the learning of these figures from Yerzenga had at the time. He 
in addition to these more theological uh, works such as the Shadagans and Encomia, he also wrote an astronomical treatise on the movement of planetary bodies. And he has a commentary on grammar as well that's rich in uh, philosophical and uh, even metaphysical um, interpretations, not just grammar as we understand it today. And Professor Roberta Irving has written uh, a lot about the grammatical tradition in Armenian, including Hovhannes uh, Yerzengatsi's grammar. And so one could look at her studies to find more about that. There was also Movsas of Yerzenga, uh, who lived right around the same time as Gostantin Yerzengatsi. Movsas of Yerzenga was a Vartabed. He was the author of many works as well, mostly of a, uh, the kind of works that a Vartabed would produce. So he has a commentary on the liturgy and on the divine office, which drew on earlier Armenian commentaries in these uh, realms, and also sermons and other ascetical instructions. Um, the, the manuscript here and in the following slides has not really much of anything to do with the uh, Kosantin Yerzengatsi. There's no like images of him. Uh, so I just, I found this manuscript, Vienna Manuscript 757, which is called Nagara Krutun Denorina Gandelyats. So kind of a, a illustrated description of the holy places in Jerusalem uh, meant for pilgrims, essentially. And um, it was just such a striking and beautiful manuscript. Mikhail Arakelyan published a study about it that's available online. And so I just uh, used images from that to, uh, to make the slides more pleasing to look at. Uh, there was also Giragos of Yerzenga. You can see he lived just a little bit later, also of Vartaben. Um, he was the author of various works, sermons, He's also well known for his commentaries on the works of Evagrius. It was around this time that the works of Evagrius were being adopted in the curriculum of Armenian monasteries. And so monks and Vartabeds were writing commentaries on them to help explain them to the students studying them. He also wrote poems, dogs, and other ascetical instructions. Now, all of these figures, associated with Yerzinga also traveled widely. They traveled to Gilikia, they traveled to other monasteries in Eastern Armenia. Some of them traveled to uh, places in Europe, even as far as Rome. They traveled to Jerusalem. And so um, it really shows you just how connected this region was and how Yerzinga was almost uh, a, a center of sorts of all these different intellectual and cultural currents. And uh, someone could write a really interesting study, like it deserves a really book-length study on uh, this very fertile intellectual and creative period, uh, all these writers associated with Yerzinga. So we finally come then to Konstantin Yerzengatsi, who lived, born in the middle of the 13th century, lived into the early 14th. He had a monastic education, but it's not uh, certain whether he was a Vartabed or uh, there's even uh, some doubt as to whether he became a monk or was he just trained in a monastery. Uh, there's not much details at all known about his life, apart from what could be derived from his poems. But he is known for uh, these 27 poems that were written, 22 of which come in a manuscript that you can see was written in 1336, so just six years after his death, by Amir Polin, uh, someone who uh, knew Konstantin Yerzengatsi. And I'll say a little bit more later about this manuscript and the way the poems are presented in it and how that's been important uh, in recent times for uh, recovering 
Gosentiniers and Gotzi's uh, reception, it, essentially, like what kind of poet was he? We'll see. And actually, we can kind of come to that right now. So um, initially, in the early 20th century and throughout the 20th century, his legacy was somewhat distorted by early Western scholarship and Soviet scholarship. Uh, so why or how did that happen? Well, early Western scholarship uh, tried to connect these early poets with the medieval poetic tradition as it was known in Europe. Uh, so they're trying to present the Armenian poets to a Western audience, and they're trying to do it in the terms and language that a Western audience would understand. And so um, in Western Europe, the there's the troubadour, the troubadours, the, the traveling minstrels who are mostly associated with courts. They would perform at the courts of, of lords and nobles. Um, or there's the divan, which is kind of the equivalent in the East, the, the courts of the East, especially in Persian uh, sort of context. And both of these kind of terms end up getting applied to these Armenian poets. Um, but it doesn't really fit so well as Theo van Lent argued in his dissertation, which was about Gosantiniers and Gatsi and presented a translation of all of his poems. He says that doesn't really fit so well because in the Armenian context, it's different. This is actually a time where you don't really have uh, courts in the Armenian context anymore because there's not the princely and kingly class is starting to disappear and go away. Rather, these many of these poets are actually associated with monasteries or other uh, sort of settings. Um, by contrast, in the Soviet era scholarship, uh, driven by its kind of Marxist, materialist, anti-religious ideology, they tried to see in these poets the beginnings of a secular literature. Uh, so even going all the way back to Gregory of Nodag, they tried to strip away the religious elements and see these poets, especially like Gostantin Yerzengatsi, who writes a lot about nature and creation, the sun, beauty. They saw them as turning to uh, earthly, worldly objects. And whatever religious elements you find in there, those are things that they just had to put there to get past the censorship of the church, which otherwise wouldn't have allowed such texts to be written. Um, the more time has gone on since the Soviet era ended, the more this is seen as just being a perspective driven by uh, 20th century outlooks on the church and uh, its oppressive role in society. Whereas if you go back and look at these figures on their own terms, you can see that they were themselves monks. They were not experiencing uh, persecution or pressure from their own tradition. Rather, they were expressing in uh, different ways than, you know, the sort of dogmatic theological treatise. They were trying to create beautiful poems that would uh, convey similar messages, but in a way that is more readily understandable, and uh, we could even say more beautiful. Um, they drawing on the way Nersa Shnodhali tried to uh, make use of the poetic genre as a way of bringing the Christian message into a form more uh, desirable, understandable, et cetera, for the people. Uh, they kind of followed in the same, the same line, the same legacy of, of writing that way. And so uh, we can credit Theo Martin Van Lint, who's the professor of Armenian studies at Oxford, for writing a, a beautiful uh, study and dissertation called Gosantin of Yerzenga, an Armenian religious poet of the 13th to 14th century, and very intentionally putting religious poet 
in the title of his dissertation to kind of mitigate against and kind of correct these, what he views, and, and I completely agree, these misguided approaches um, that came before him. So he says, for example, that Gosantin Yersengotsi emerges as a, a religious poet, a mystical poet whose fundamental value is love, which originates in God. And so in his dissertation, he reads all of his works as religious poems and rejects attempts to view them as the inauguration of a secularizing movement in Armenian poetry. Uh, let's look at some examples uh, of this. Quick question, uh, Jesse. Yeah. Is that the prior page? It's a little off topic, but on the prior page, is that the is that an image of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem? It, it is, yes. So this okay. manuscript, I was saying, is a illustrated guide to the holy places in Jerusalem. Uh, it comes from the 17th century. And um, I just kind of chose it to go along with the lecture, but there, there's no images of Gosantiniers and Gotsi or these yeah. other poets, which is why I, I just kind of picked a, a fun manuscript to bring in. Thanks. Yep. So it was the nature poems that uh, Soviet scholars would especially latch on to as showing, um, you know, this turn towards secular topics in, in their view. But as Theo Van Lint writes, um, this is a really lovely quote he has, the medieval worldview held that God speaks through his word and through his works. His creation refers to him in every possible way. Natural phenomena are brimming with symbolic meaning. To see a flower in spring means to think of Christ's resurrection. And he goes on, the perception of nature remained wholly within the realm of the religious, and Gosantin himself warns against worship of it rather than of its maker. Nature was perceived by Gosantin as part of God's work, which he could rejoice in without failing in his piety. He worshiped the creator through creation. And there's a nice uh, little excerpt from one of his poems that gets at this. Heaven and earth, sea and dry land, out of nothing were created by love. By your word, Lord, we became alive because you are he who gives life to us. Um, we can see a nice example of this in one of his poems, which we can look at. Uh, I'm not gonna read the Armenian, but it'll be there on the screen. And this is actually uh, from an article by James Russell who translated it, and he's a great translator of poetry. So let's look at his translation. So this one, in this one, you get to see how Gosantin uses uh, nature, in this case, the sun and light, similar to Nurses Shonali's works. Um, but through nature, we get to the creator. And you can see how this happens in this poem. Now this night is past, the morning sign has come and the shining star rises, herald of the light. The darkness was rejected and all the world rejoiced, calling blessings to each other that they were worthy of the light. For them who had been captive and in the deep dungeons dark, now the light is born in the great light of the sun. The earth was cold and frozen by the icy winter blast, but spring has come at last in the great light of the sun. The earth has come to life, mountain and plain are mantled in green, and the trees burst into flower in the great light of the sun. Flowers in all their nations are adorned in every color, and the red rose opens in the great light of the sun. You can see how you, it, it almost feels like there's elements of it that are like the prayers or the sharagans, as we know them from the Jamekutun but it also goes 
uh, further into developing uh, these beautiful images of nature and uh, much more rich in its description and just appreciation of the created world. The fountains of the waters burst bubbling forth in laughter and the rivers rushing churn in the great light of the sun. All the creatures that are and those that lay unsold and dead, behold, they are revived in the great light of the sun. How are you not amazed? Why do you not ask of these things about this sun full of its shining light? This new light for us has dawned far brighter than the sun, and to its mighty luminescence the elder stars are servants. And so you can see here now it's starting to turn to uh, a kind of like allegorical reading where uh, we move from the sun, the physical sun and physical light, to the creator of the sun and the creator of light, uh, spiritual light. A beam brimming light was born of that light, of that beginning, light born from light, from the great light of the sun. This light is of that light, which is itself Lord of all light, and is called King, and the light of all is from his light. The ark of heaven stood amazed before that sun, for it had never seen such light, nor the sun from that light. The earth was happy, glad at the tidings, that the duskless great light has dawned, and the sun of that light. Some are soulless, without understanding, blind in their eyes, who believe not in the sun and its light. In darkness they drag out their lives, asleep in dreams. They share no light from the sun, from the great light. Look how much emphasis is on light and the sun, light and the sun. It it reminds you, or it reminds me of the the Adavakali uh, service by where Nurses Shnodali wrote so many hymns, um, especially focusing on the image of Jesus as the sun, the sun of righteousness and the light, in order to attract the uh, Adavortik, the the Zoroastrian uh, Armenians who who worship the sun and light, and so here goes Santinirs and Gatsi is is doing a similar sort of thing, drawing on the 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 way that we human beings are so attracted to the sun and light, but but uh, taking us through the physical up into the the spiritual. I believe not in that lying spirit, that it is light itself, and no beam stretches from the sun, from the great light. I, Constantine, who wrote this, long for that light, that I may be enlightened in the sun, in that great light. So really a beautiful uh, poem that's uh, rich, both in descriptions, of the natural world, the created world, and also rich in spiritual and symbolic meaning. One of the ways in which uh, Theo van Lent argued, I think most convincingly for understanding Gosantin Yerzengansi as a religious poet, is by going back to this early manuscript and looking at the way the poems are written and the order in which they're presented in it. So in the edition of his works that was done, I, th I think in the 70s by a Soviet scholar, they ordered the poems such that all the ones that are kind of most having to do with nature or uh, love and things like that are kind of put in the front. And all the ones that have more heavily or like overtly religious topics are pushed to the back, um, which kind of shows the the order in which or the 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 value structure that those reading it at the time had. Well, in the original manuscript, uh, Venice number 103, the 
poems have a different order. And remember, these were copied by someone who knew Gosantiniers and Gotzi, maybe even uh, knew the order in which he might have conceived his poems to come. So it starts with a very short uh, biblical epic, kind of after the manner that we saw Grigor Magistros and Nersesh Nodali, that spans the story of creation and all the way to uh, Christ and the Gospels, but not super long, like 160 lines. And um, this, in the, what Theo van Lint says, is this really sets the stage for establishing the worldview and the perspective in which the rest of the poems are meant to be read. This is the outlook, you know, the poet has, and the rest of the poems kind of follow uh, this, this basic uh, biblical Christian worldview. Secondly, after all of the 22 poems come, there is a sermon by Hovhannes Yerzengatzi, which uh, reiterates some of the themes in the poems and focuses on, you know, the practical and the, the way you can apply Christ's teaching and uh, religious teaching to your life. And so he says that the manuscript then emerges as a kind of personal devotional book that was used by people uh, not unlike you would use a prayer book or something like that, uh, but uh, rather than being just for monks, it could be uh, very readily appreciated by lay people or others because of uh, the the way the beautiful way the poetry is written. So he argues for, rather than trying to present Armenian poets on Western terms, or in ways that suit our own, you know, agendas or beliefs today, he argues for what he calls an intrinsic approach, which is to interpret medieval Armenian poetry on its own terms. So he says that he reads Kosantin Yerzengatsi's works as a unity, Christian in character throughout, with a mystical dimension in some of the poems about nature and in those about love. And the overarching goal of the poet and thus and those who would read it is imitatio Christi, so imitation of, of the life of Christ. And um, one of the other interesting things, just like we saw in the poem before is how there's these different layers and levels of meaning at, at present or present or at work in Gosantin Yerzengotzi's poetry. And he has these terms for this, ihoki yev imarnin. So for example, in the heading to poem five, it's called Pank Hergutamas Madats Dasutyunk, Ihoki Yev Imarmin. Zor Aragok Hosi Aispes. So a poem to be interpreted in two ways, after the spirit and after the body, which is thus spoken allegorically. Um, he has also a series of a couple poems on the rose and the nightingale, which is a typical theme in poetry of this time. And the first poem is just the rose and the nightingale. And then there's a second poem that offers the spiritual interpretation of it. And Gosantin Yosengotsi, as we'll see, was writing not just for monks who were familiar with how this allegorical interpretation worked from the study of scripture and other exegetical traditions, but he was writing for uh, common people who weren't necessarily educated in this sophisticated kind of interpretation. So he goes out of his way to help explain and accommodate for people how, how you're meant to read and interpret these poems. And that's a very interesting aspect of his work that we can see is how you have this uh, monk or monastic sort of figure that's trying to bring uh, this high level like monastic wisdom and theological interpretation, but put it in a way and form that's palatable, receivable uh, for everyday people. 
And what you end up with is an approach that gives full approval and full space for the physicality of creation and human beings uh, who are composed of mind, body, and spirit. And you get these lovely affirmations of this, like, for example, in this poem 13. Serni kene, sirni kene, hampirutyam kyalni kene, mitknu chalk yevchoskni kene, amenatun pashchok tuas, kuini kene, herni kene, ha muhod anushni kene, baitzarutyan dipni kene, uznosa parok batvok tuas. Love is from you. The heart is from you. Living in perseverance is from you. Thought and mind and word are from you. The bestower of them on everyone you are. Color is from you. Beauty is from you. Taste and sweet smell are from you. The impression made by splendor is from you. The one who honors them with glory you are. You can see this real... Uh, affirmation and just celebration of the richness and beauty of physical creation, how this is all created and approved uh, by God and to be celebrated. It's not a sort of rejection of the body in favor of the spirit. It's arriving at the spiritual through the material. So unifying and harmonizing them, not favoring one over the other. That doesn't mean to say, that's not to say that there's no conflict <laughs> between the two realms, as everyone knows who tries to live according to uh, you know, a higher way that doesn't just follow their every impulse and inclination. So he also has these wisdom and didactic poems that really get at the heart of the human condition and the struggle between uh, following your, your rational and the ideal that you imagine for yourself, and then all these forces in your body that are pulling you to do things that the higher part of you doesn't approve of. So for example, this poem or section of this poem, Na hogas zanta di vair hagel. Sagav mi i churwin, potsen hruise hantardel. Kamine hoknutun, yev porpoke us hudes varel. Yergu gamads zara, tejare ins hirat sazel. My soul ardently longs to listen to the words of the wise. My body is voluptuous because it is born from this world. Between those two, I am a wax candle consumed in the fire. Without foundation and unsteady, I have wandered restlessly. By four opposites now, I have been tossed about. So here's the understanding of all of creation, including human being, as composed of the four elements which are like at war and in conflict with each other, but also by which all movement and all the dynamism of the, of the universe happens. Because the fire pulls upward, but the earth drags down heavily. The flame of this fire is only calmed a bit by the water, or the wind comes to its aid and incites the fire. A servant of two desires, it is difficult for me to satisfy both. So you can see how he might express the human condition in terms and language and in a kind of metaphysical understanding that's different from ours today, but it's still identifying the same 
inner conflicts that we all know and feel and experience, but maybe just understand in different language. Now, there's some other interesting things we can say or derive from the poems about the context in which they were read and performed. So there's certain indications in his poem where it's clear that he was actually reciting these out loud. Like they were meant not just to be read, but to be recited out loud. So here we can see how um, we're moving into this kind of in-between space in these poems between the kind of literary monastic works on the one hand and the the Gusan Ashu performers on the other. These poets are kind of carving out a middle space for themselves where they're borrowing the, the genres and the way of performing from the Gusans, but infusing it with Christian material. So here we can see some indications of the fact that he would actually recite these to people. I, Constantine, who am writing for you, am teaching the good words. Then why have I strayed from the way of justice? Then let us all who hear these commandments pray, asking Christ to forgive me for my transgressions. So the fact that he refers to those who are hearing uh, these words, or hear even more so. So this is the heading to one of his poems. He says, a man was seated and recited the Shahnameh aloud. The Shahnameh is a Persian epic the famous Persian epic. It says, the, brother, the brothers asked me, recite for us a poem in the fashion of the Shahnameh. So I composed this poem. Read it in the way the Shahnameh is read. Or, so, Ishahnameh sign gartatsek. Gartal originally means call out. So maybe even like recite it in the way the Shahnameh is recited. So here you can see that um, Again, you have this kind of performance context where people are getting together to recite and share these poems. And again, in Michael Pfeiffer's book, he talks a lot about how this was the standard way that poetry was performed and shared at the time among Persians, Turks, and Armenians. Again, here, there are some brothers who, like me, and want a worldly song in writing, and I have recited many a love poem in a well-known melody. So we obviously don't know anymore what these kind of melodies were, um, but we can imagine them even being uh, sung, you know, not just recited, but perhaps even sung. Maybe there was even accompanying in instrumentation for some of these. A question, Jesse? Yeah. Would Shahnameh have been uh, read in Persian or uh, a translation? In Persian, probably. So, so these, these people knew more than one language. Uh, Armenians always seem to know more than one language. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I think so here because... Um, you know, if they're trying to engage in trade or uh, have dealings with the government or things like that, it would have been useful to know Persian, which was the language of of the uh, government administration and trade and things like that. New Persian in this period. So Persian would probably have been a kind of shared language between Armenians, Persians, Turks, maybe even Arabs in this period. Good, thanks. Mm -hmm. Another thing that was drawn from the Persian uh, kind of environment and started to inform Armenian society were uh, these lay brotherhoods. So we all know about monastic communities, monastic brotherhoods. At this time, there were also, in the Islamic context, they're called futuwa, uh, Lay, lay brotherhoods, essentially like lay fraternities, urban lay fraternities, which were usually oriented around the different trades 
to almost like unions today, where the members of the fraternity were meant to, uh, by belonging to that, you would get help in times of need. Um, they would make sure you got a good burial, uh, help you when you're sick. Um, if you're traveling, they could provide help with traveling from one place to another. Um, travelers of the time talk about the hospitality that the the urban fraternities or brotherhoods, you know, offered to travelers. And um, it's clear from Gosantin Yerzengatsi's poetry that some of his poems he composed for monks, but others he composed for and and performed to these urban lay brotherhoods. So again, as I, as I was saying, it's like bringing the monastic wisdom into a context and in a form that is suitable for people living outside the monastery. And one of my predecessors at the Zohrab Information Center, Rachel Goshgarian, has written a lot about these urban lay fraternities and how they started to develop in Armenian society at this time. Um, I want to close by, we probably won't finish this poem, but just to read at least a little bit of this poem, which is his most famous poem. Uh, it's also incomplete at the end because uh, at the end, there's like a page missing from the manuscript. So the poem's already incomplete. We couldn't finish it if we wanted to. But the beginning and most of this poem is so interesting because it shows this uh, conflict and tension that there was over uh, Gosantin years and Gatsis, people complaining and saying, what kind of authority do you have to, to write these works? So look at the beginning. It says, this is just the heading before the poem. Some speak ill of me out of envy, saying, how can he recite such a poem as he has not had much tuition from a Vartabed? Uh, he, he was not a Vartabed. He was, he did receive some training in a monastery, but he never received that Vartabed ordination, which is the Armenian church's way of like certifying and authorizing a teacher. And so as he started to recite these poems and, and make these poems, there was some backlash and uh, criticism from people, you know, on what grounds do you think you have to write and teach in this way? He says, well now, working is one thing and the grace of the spirit another. Therefore, I will tell you about my vision about that wonderful vision that I saw when I lived in the monastery as a 15-year-old, when I saw a man dressed in a sun robe and filled with light. So look how interesting this is. This is his poem that's like his response to justifying on what grounds he has for creating the poetry he does. So he says, some are wicked towards me and are envious of me, because of the poems which I have written and which have become known among the people. They say, how can he write such a sweet tasting poem and recite it to us as if no one among us is his peer or par? The eyes of their spirits are blinded. In their deliberations, they are foolish without understanding. Because who possesses the understanding or the grace that rests on me? I am an earthen vessel and a treasure has been poured into me. What I say through the spirit is the manna of the great Lord. Whoever steals this treasure and behaves fraudulently towards me is against God and he will pass judgment on him. Whoever devotes his attention to me and understands what I am saying, I will give a sign of how that grace has befallen me. So look how in these lines, he's, he's saying, I'm not, presenting my own teaching or my own words. I received a grace or gift from the Holy Spirit, and I'm doing what I was inspired and what was imparted to me to do. And in the rest of the poem, he conveys what that mission or vision and kind of like poetic authorization or authorization to create 
came directly from God. And if you think about um, certain stories from the Bible, this really resonates with things you find in the scriptures. He's probably uh, drawing on as models. So, for example, there's the Apostle Paul, who, remember, he was not a follower of Christ. Uh, quite the opposite. He was a persecutor of the apostles. And then one day he has a vision when he's on the way to Damascus and receives the teaching directly from Christ. And then when he starts going around teaching, there's a bunch of backlash from the other disciples, other apostles saying, who is this guy who's going around teaching as if he's an apostle when not only did he not even know Christ on earth, which is a condition for being an apostle, but he was persecuting all of the apostles. And then Paul justifies himself based on the vision that he received directly from Christ. Um, also, you'll see kind of similarities or resonances with the prophets of the Old Testament, um, how in all of them, you know, Isaiah, Ezekiel, in the beginning of the book is this vision or encounter where the prophet encounters either God or an angel and is given the message that they're supposed to then convey. So he's saying, that's what I'm doing. I'm not creating on my own talent, my own skill, my own merits, but this came as a gift and I'm just a vessel through which the spirit is speaking. So he says, when I was a 15 year old child, I received tuition in a monastery. And one night I had a vision. A radiant boy was seated on a throne like a king. Beautiful he was like the sun, so that he shone. So terrified I was by his majesty and light that I could not ask him, Lord, who are you? Tell me your name. I worshipped him the moment I saw him, and with three supplications I prostrated myself. I said, I am a sinner. You are king. I have sinned against you. I said, my soul is sick. In you I have found a physician for myself. I said, I am poor, and for a long time I have longed for words. Grace this your servant with a share and a part and with the word. Because his heart is compassionate, he soon relents towards this unworthy one. He rises from his throne and places his foot on me. He presses his foot down on me and walks away to his seat. It's almost like he's stomping out or getting rid of, like, you know, the human. So that what can rise up is, you know, a full servant or mouth of of the Mm -hmm. king, who here is obviously Christ. When my request was fulfilled, I rose to my feet satisfied. I said, let your countenance be sufficient majesty for me. If you feel compassion for this useless servant, and your countenance continually appears before me, I will renounce this vain life now that I saw you, now that you have accepted me and called me your servant. He answered me and said in a sweet voice, go. His terrible voice scared me so that I woke up. I rise and tie my belt around me and went to pray on my own. I asked for that holy vision that it would appear to me again. Many days passed in which I prayed in tears, for I desired to see his radiant countenance once again. During the day I found no rest and I could not fall asleep at night. I became as one who has lost his senses and confessed to no one at all. I could not grasp what kind of thing this vision was and did not investigate it, for my age was that of a child. When I had once more dedicated myself to study for many days, I reflected on this mystery and understood it. These lines are also important because he's showing here, like, okay, yes, I had this vision, but it happened in the context of me being educated in a monastery. So I was learning from Bartabed's. And even after I had this vision, I spent many more, you know, days studying. So he's he's establishing it's not just this 
you know, vision, inspiration that comes. But I also, I did my homework too. It's not true that I didn't spend time studying. And then he says, suddenly I was able to make a poem for whoever liked me to, in such a way that I was surprised at my ability to string words together. With all my heart and full of hope, I attempted this matter. I gave my soul in exchange for it, and then I reached that spirit. But look at the Armenian line, as hokis pochan devi, yev abba yes ein hokuin hasa. What he's saying is, I gave up my own spirit, and in exchange, I received that spirit. Meaning, essentially, he's not writing his own words. He's a vessel through which the spirit of God is conveying his message. And he goes on to, to basically say that the gift of the word that has come to me out of the light is manna for me, because with my own eyes, I saw him seated high on that throne. Because I received this great gift out of that light, I have delivered myself body and soul as servant of his holy countenance. So yes, lot, lots of interesting things uh, in these poems and really the Armenian is, is incredibly beautiful in his poetry and he does a lot of, a lot of variation in, in the rhyme schemes and in the number of syllables and, and different poetic devices. And um, it's a language that finally is is really close to the way people would have spoken at the time. And we see this kind of burst of creative poetic output coming from writers starting around this time in the 13th century and continuing uh, really all the way up into the modern period. And he kind of stands at the outset of this uh, new phase, we could say, in medieval Armenian poetry and medieval Armenian literature. And we'll kind of continue that trajectory, looking at other great poets in this tradition um, next time. It's actually not going to be next week, because next week is Vartanans at, at the cathedral, and I'm not going to be available uh, that Thursday, so in two weeks' time. And we're going to look at Mugardich Nagash, who was a 15th century poet, and um, there will be uh, some actual modern renditions, musical renditions of the poetry of Mugardich Nagash by John Hodian, who's an American Armenian uh, classical music composer who discovered the poetry of Mugardich Nagash and over the course of several years set it to music and has a group of Armenian singers performing uh the music in a in a very um you know creative and new way you know not, obviously not based on melodies of the time no one knows what they were but kind of like a modern rendition and i'll play a couple examples of that and actually for the first time um the nagash ensemble is actually touring through the u.s right now and they're coming to new york on i think march 12th or something i'll, I'll get the details um, next time they're going to be it's the 11th in New York uh, March 11th thanks good work yeah, yeah they'll be at Carnegie Hall and um, they've toured all across Europe and they play in Armenia frequently but this is the first time they're going to be playing in the U.S. they're starting in LA and kind of making their way across so we'll get a kind of taste and preview of it in a couple weeks <laughs> 